You know, growing up, one of my favorite movies to watch was the Terminator series. I don't know if you guys have heard of this movie before. It came out in the 1980s or the first one, and it starred Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the old days when he looked really great. I mean, physique-wise, you guys know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is, right? I mean, he's an old grandpa-like figure right now, but back then, he was like a big bodybuilder. And you know the interesting thing about this Terminator movie that I really liked was that the plot itself was just really awesome because it talked about how there was this future war where uh, there's this resistance leader named John Connor who pretty much uh, leads the resistance to fighting all these machines. So what the machines tried to do uh, is that they tried to send a Terminator back in time in order to kill John Connor's mother in order to stop... Uh, basically this resistance movement. I know it's kind of a weird mind twisting type of a plot, but that's how Terminator 1 starts out. So what happens is that Arnold Schwarzenegger plays the villain. He plays the actual Terminator. So a Terminator is basically, on the outside, he looks just like a human being, exactly like a human being, but inside he's a machine, he's a cyborg. So he comes like that as a disguise in Terminator 1, Terminator 2, Terminator 3, you kind of get the gist. Now the thing is that these Terminator models are all made pretty much according to a template. So that means every single Terminator that's sent back in time would have to look exactly the same. Now of course Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the 80s was like your definition of a perfect human being in the way he looks. I mean all his muscles and everything like that. So when he came in Terminator 1 obviously he looked really fantastic. You know when he came through the time portal he came naked and everything. He's like really like your ideal figure basically and your ideal look. But then of course uh, when Terminator 2 came out that was seven years later so he had to come back in a time portal again and he looked almost pretty much the same. But then what happened was the uh, studios decided to make Terminator 3. Now keep in mind, Terminator 3 was 12 years after the second one and 19 years after the first one. So back in my college days when I was at UCLA, it was the movie that I was actually really looking forward to. And uh, I was asking myself, man, can Arnold Schwarzenegger actually look the same? Since all of these Terminator models need to look the same when they come back in the time portal. So uh, based on the reports that I heard, it was said that Arnold Schwarzenegger had to get his body prepared for about six months in order to look identical to how he did in Terminator 1 and 2. So of course, when we saw him on the screen, uh, he looked pretty close to how he looked like in 1 and 2. I can't say he looked exactly the way he did in 1 and 2, but for a 52, 53 year old guy, I thought it was very impressive. Okay, so maybe now you want to go back and actually watch that movie. See, at that time, the special effects couldn't cover that up, but he did whatever he could in order to uh, look exactly the part. Now, here's the sad thing. If you were to ask Arnold to come back and do it again in 2022, how do you think he would look like on the screen right now? Do you think he can still play the Terminator and still look exactly the same? No. And it's pretty sad, right? Because there's a part of me that's thinking, oh man, I wish he could, so then he could just make more Terminator movies and it would just be so fun. But now, he just looks like an old grandpa, basically. And no muscles, really. Or very weird looking muscles. So the reason that I tell this story is that this is a thing that we don't just see with Arnold, but we see this with a lot of people, right? With athletes, with wrestlers, with movie stars, even our family and friends. No matter what we do to ourselves, we can't fix the problem of aging and disease and sickness and then ultimately death. You know, people all around the world are trying to find a cure to death, but nobody has found it yet and nobody will. But what if I were to tell you that there is a cure to death through God himself who provides the answer so that one day we will be pretty much free from sin and we can actually have a body that looks perfect. Absolutely perfect for all eternity. That is the issue 
that Paul talks about in this passage that we are going to look at today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 38. In fact, this theme is really so central to the gospel message that if we don't really understand it, then we don't really know Christ and we don't know what, what exactly we're looking towards. So that is where you need to be today in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 38. Now, once again, I, like I've been saying this whole time, the Corinthian church is not an ideal church whatsoever. There were just so many pro things that were wrong with this church. There was all these fights, all these divisions, sexual immorality, misuse of gifts, selfishness, a lot of really, really crazy things happening at this church. And so last week I was talking to you, remember how Paul was talking about the resurrection, right? In fact, I was talking to you about this for the last two weeks. He's saying the resurrection is such an important part of the gospel that we have to believe it in order to be saved. That if you don't believe in the resurrection, you cannot be a Christian. So that is why he spends so much time talking about the resurrection in this one chapter. In fact, this week, Paul is going to continue to talk about the resurrection. So now in this week, he's going to talk about what kind of a body we're going to have when the resurrection happens happens, how it's going to be so different in many ways from our bodies. Yes, it's going to look very similar in some ways, but then it's going to be totally different. It's going to be fit for all eternity. In fact, that's the theme of today's passage. So this passage that we're going to look at shows us that the future resurrection for all Christians is a certain event as seen the, through these three discussions that I'm going to share with you guys today. So the first discussion that I'm going to share with you that shows us the certainty of the resurrection is point number one, the analogy of the resurrection. So he's going to show us what the resurrection is like for Christians. So we're going to begin in verse 35. So let's look at 35 to 41 together. And thank you so much, guys, for following in because it really helps you to get more involved as we open up our Bibles and we look at together. So let's look at it together. If you have your Bibles on your phone, or in person, let's look at it together. So he says this in verse 35. He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Okay, so like I said, there are some people back then who had these false views of the resurrection because there was this philosophy that was going around that said everything to do with your body in this life, that's bad. So we want to have our spirits go on into the afterlife. That's a good thing. Why do we want a new body? We don't want a new body. Let's just let our souls just be free from our body and that's it. But Jesus was telling them, or actually Paul was telling them, that's wrong thinking because God has created your body and you will have a body for all eternity, either in heaven or in hell. That's why he says in verse 36, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds a body of its own own. He's using this analogy of planting a seed on the ground. You know, like a seed, have you guys ever planted a seed in your backyard and watched the thing grow? You know how it starts out as a seed so small, but then when you put it in the ground, it, it decomposes in the ground. It, it dies basically. But then what happens is that something marvelous grows out of that ground. So that's exactly what Paul is saying. It's very much like that with all believers is that it pretty much is like that with us as well. That first, we're like that seed that dies, is planted in the ground, and then one day it's going to blossom in God's timing. That's why I read to you guys earlier, John chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. See, even Jesus himself, do you, do you see how when Jesus was crucified on the cross, he died, right? He died as a human being because he needed to pay the penalty for our sin, which is death. But then guess what? God awarded Jesus for his efforts. The Father awarded him and then he gave him a resurrected body. So he was kind of like that seed that fell into the ground, 
but then sprouted into a new form. Jesus came back in a glorified body and he says, this is the body that you will all have in the future as well. See, I like this analogy by one Christian that says this. He said, so the graveyards of men become the seed plots of resurrection and the cemeteries of God's people become the resurrection fields of the promised perfection. Oh yeah, God is going to do it. He can do it. You're probably thinking, well, why isn't he doing it? All my relatives are dying and they're in the grave and, well, you know, what's going on? God is saying, wait, because in his timing, they're all going to resurrect. You're going to see this. I'm going to make a new body for him. That's why he tells us in verses 39 to 41 to remind us of God's power. So Paul says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. See, we, our bodies... You know, we're going to die in one form, but God is going to create a completely new one. So basically, Paul is telling us that if God can create so many of these different life forms, he surely can create a new body for you. So let me tell you, this is really the lesson behind point number one. Don't think that the gospel is all about you die, you get buried six feet under, or you get cremated, whatever, but then your soul, you just kind of go on to heaven and you spend all your eternity there. Uh uh God is saying that that body is going to be made new. He, because remember, the gospel is not meant to just give us a ticket to heaven and then we just do whatever we want in heaven. The gospel is meant to free us from what sin did to us. So what did sin did, do to us? Well, obviously it made us corrupt, right? But you know, another thing that sin did to us is that it completely changed our body, which means that we're going to die. We're going to decompose. We're going to get weak. We're going to get sick. You know, all those things that we just are so afraid of because we know it, eventually it's going to happen in our life, right? See, I know all of you, you're so young right now. So you're not thinking about that. But wait till you get to my age when, I'm 30, when you're 37 years old. Then you're going to start thinking about those things. Jesus is saying one day we will be reunited with our bodies and God is going to make it new. That's why we should be looking towards the resurrection. Okay, then what is our new body going to be like? Maybe you're asking that. So that's exactly what Paul is going to tell us in the second discussion today that shows us about the truth of the resurrection. Now we're going to look at the order of the resurrection, how God is going to make this play out. We see this in verses 42 to 49, the order of the resurrection. So let's see how he's going to basically play this out. In verse 42, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So if there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body body. Like I said, life begins us being born in this body. How pitiful is that, right? We're born in this body and sometimes when we're born, we don't turn out perfect. I'm not talking about just having a birthmark here, birthmark here, or whatever. Sometimes people are born with no limbs, no legs. They're born with all these defects. Already, we're, sometimes some of us are messed up by the time we come into this world. It's not the ideal body that we want to have. But you know, Jesus is saying, even though this is the way we were born, in weakness and dishonor, one day we are going to be given a new body that is glorious and beautiful. So I want to give you a little bit of an analogy. Have you guys ever raised a plant before, like a flower? or seen a flower bloom? Have you seen like when it's so small, it grows and grows, but then you're waiting for it to grow and then it gets to its most beautiful stage. Have you guys ever seen a flower that looks so beautiful? It's like so radiant. It looks so healthy when you look at it, right? But then what happens eventually? Does that flower just stay like that forever? It doesn't. 
Have you noticed that it just withers, 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 and then it dies? No matter how much you water it, no matter how much sunlight you put on the flower, you can't save it. This thing just like withers and it dies, no matter what you try to do to it. So I'm giving you this analogy because if you think about it, it's the same way with us as well, right? I mean, I don't know what exactly is the ideal stage of a human being. Some people say it's age 25. I know like women talk about that sometimes, like you get to 25 and then everything is just downhill from there. Some people say it's age 30, but have you noticed that after a certain time, you notice people are withering, right? No matter how much they exercise, no matter how much vitamins they take, no matter how much they try to do those cucumber treatments to their face, or you know, I don't know those beauty products they're using, we cannot look the same, right? That we're just gonna wither and wither and wither until we eventually die. In fact, even when our bodies go into the grave, it doesn't just stay like that. You know how a body decomposes and it looks just so ugly when you see it? Yeah, that, I mean, that's the reality. That's what's gonna to happen to everybody. But Jesus is saying, one day we're gonna have a new body. It's gonna be so perfect. It's going to be a beautiful body that is just like Jesus's for all eternity. I mean, could you guys imagine looking like 30 years old for all eternity or something like that? I mean, even thinking about like your grandparents, you know, when they died, they went to be with the Lord, but can you imagine one day you're gonna look at them and they're gonna be like 30 years old, so beautiful right before you. Be like, hey grandpa, how's it going? Really, that's, uh, that's the body we want. I mean, does that excite you? It excites me when I think about it because Jesus is saying right now we're in a natural body, but one day we will have a spiritual body, which is going to be awesome. So in verse 45, he continues and tells us this order of how it's gonna happen. He says, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Oh, yeah. We know who the second Adam is, right? That's Jesus. Yes, all of us are born under Adam. That's why we all age. We all die. You know, Adam was given life. And if he had obeyed God, he would have lived eternally. I mean, now he does live eternally in heaven with God, but then he disobeyed God and then the curse was put up upon him. That's why Adam, even though he lived to 900 something years old, he eventually died, right? And all of his children, we also, he, we also die as well. But Jesus, he's the second Adam because he did Adam's work perfectly. He lived a sinless life. That is why in Christ, we have eternal life. That is amazing. You see, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, you guys remember I talked about this a few months ago. Paul says in this epistle, For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, and that's talking of Adam, even so, the, through the obedience of the one, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Yeah, that's the hope we're looking towards, brothers and sisters. You see, Paul continues and says, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. So just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Mm, yeah, that is why we have so much to look forward to. See, if you're here in this body, don't live for this body because this body is going to go into the grave. You know how so many people, they say, this life is your only life right now. So you got to do whatever you can to take care of your body and to make it everything. But you know what? No matter what we do to our bodies, we're going to die. I mean, even if we get our limbs amputated, is this limb gonna just grow back by itself? It will take a miracle for that to happen, right? Because this body, eventually, we're gonna suffer the consequences of sin, which is we're gonna age, we're going to suffer, we're gonna get sick, we're gonna be in a wheelchair, maybe, hopefully not for some of you, but a lot of us maybe will be when we grow older, 
and then we're going to die. Do you know all of this is kind of a preview of hell in many ways? Because in hell, there's nothing good that happens. It's just like an eternal, miserable experience forever and ever and ever. But if you're a Christian here today, you have repented and believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, this life is the only hell that you're ever going to experience. And then everything afterwards is just bliss. But you know what? If you have not truly repented of your sins and placed your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this life with all its imperfections is the only heaven you'll ever experience. And then everything after that will have a very sharp decline. So I'm telling this to you because if you're a Christian, you should look forward to this new body. Are you guys looking forward to this new body? Because I'm looking forward to this new body. It's going to be just like Jesus's. I mean, that's great, right? So here's the thing. Don't get so obsessed with your body right now. Now, I'm not saying, you know, trash your body and look ugly and, uh, you know, make yourself sick by eating so much and being unhealthy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying don't stress out about it as if like this is the only thing you'll have for all eternity because God says it's going to change one day. Okay, so... Maybe um, you get persecuted or you get attacked and uh, you get a life injury. You know what Jesus is saying? Don't worry about it. Because even if you lose some things in this life, you're going to get it back for all eternity. In fact, he's saying there's this one event that we're going to be looking towards in which we're going to actually see this happening and this should fill us with excitement. This is in the third and the last point we're going to look at the process of the resurrection in verses 50 to 58. So he's going to show us here how this resurrection event is going to look like. So let's look at the last uh, nine verses together today. So Paul says this, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable perishable. Paul's saying that you can't just enter heaven just the way you are right now. You can't because the body you're in right now is only fit for this life in this world. But when you are in heaven, you need a new glorified body that's fit for heaven. You can't enter in with your flesh. You need to be made new. And how is it that Jesus is going to make us new? We see that in verse 51. He talks about this event that's going to happen in the future. He says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. So this event that Paul talks about here, this is what's fam famously called the rapture of the church. So this event is an event that's going to happen in the future, which I believe happens before a time of tribulation comes into the world, where in some unannounced moment, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to raise pretty much everybody from the dead, as well as Christians, and they're all going to go to heaven immediately, just like that. Remember, once again, called the rapture of the church. Like I said, this could happen at any time. In fact, even 30 minutes from now, five minutes from now, if God decides, he can come back and say, rapture time, we're all going right now to be with me. And then when that happens, all the events in the book of Revelation is going to happen and it's going to be terrible in this world. But we want to be a part of this rapture because even Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17, which I'm going to show you in a few weeks from now. He says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. 
You know, I'm telling you, the Bible doesn't tell us when this event is going to happen. So I hope you're ready at any time when this happens, because God says, I'm not taking everybody with me to heaven. He says that if you're here and you're not saved and you're not a Christian, you're going to be left behind. So don't let that happen to you. Because if you get left behind, you have to go through a terrible time of great tribulation that's coming to this world. So you want to be a part of the rapture. And he says, the rapture is pretty much God's reward to those who have placed their faith in Christ. Because at the rapture, what happens is that our body changes instantly into a glorified body, just like that. Just like Jesus' body and we'll be with him for all eternity. So yeah, I, don't, I can't tell you when exactly this event's going to happen. All I can tell you is just be ready at any moment so that all is well between you and God. We want this to happen because this is where salvation is finally finished. That's what he says in verses 53 to 54. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Ooh, wow. Like I said, the greatest enemy of humanity is death. You know that? We can't seem to fix this problem of death, no matter how much we try to find a cure for death. We spend billions of dollars in medicine to try to find a cure to death, but we can't find it. But you know what? Once we are transformed at the rapture, then at that moment we can say, death, I have conquered you. Death cannot hold me down. Just like death couldn't hold Jesus down, the Bible says that Christians well, can say the same thing, that death will not hold me down. You know, I heard a story, it's a funny story about how a bee flew into a car where a dad was driving and there was a boy and then, you know, little kids, when they see these kind of insects, they freak out and they start screaming and all that. So the dad, he grabbed the bee and then he opened his hand and the bee started to fly around again and the, the kid was like, ah, dad, dad, do something. But then the father said, don't worry, son, you don't have to panic because I took the, the sting out of the bee. You see right here. So now all the bee can do is just make noise. You know, in the same way, it's just like that with us as Christians as well. Because if we have believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God has taken the sting away from death. So now all we can hear is just the, the noise. But he says, don't get frightened by that because Death is not going to hold you down. Do you know why we die? According to verse 56, it says we die because of sin. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. You know the law, the Ten Commandments, for example? It shows us that we're headed on death row. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You look at yourself under the commandments and you got to say, whoa, I've broken those commandments. I'm in trouble before God. Because God says, if you break my law, there's death coming. There's a hell coming for you. There is justice coming for you. There's punishment coming for you. You can't just do all that stuff and think you're going to get away with it. There has to be accountability. That's why we all have a conscience. Yeah, for sure. If we die like that, if we die in our sins, then yes, we will stand before God on the day of judgment. God is going to open up the book and he's going to say, look, this is what you did on this day. 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 Do you think you deserve heaven? I mean, how, how many of us can really say we deserve heaven after seeing our sins read off like that in front of us? I'd be very embarrassed. I'd be horrified. I would look at that list and say, oh, Lord God, I don't even remember some of these things I've done. Whoa, that is crazy. And God is going to tell us, whether you remembered it or not, you're getting punished right now. And this is what a judge does to a criminal. That's the way the story could have ended. But you know what? It ends another way for Christians because verse 57, Paul thanks God and he says, 
Thanks be to God who gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's what the gospel is. I've been teaching you this for so many months right now. Jesus Christ came in so that he can basically take the guilt away from us. That's why he died on the cross as our substitute, so that whatever we should have been punished for in hell, he took it upon himself so that death won't harm us whatsoever. So that is why we can have victory over death because our sins are taken away. We have the righteousness of Christ, which is ours when we place our faith in Christ. That is why we have victory over death and hell. So that is why we have every reason to rejoice. Does that move you guys whatsoever? Does it touch you whatsoever? Because if it doesn't touch you, if you say, oh, the, you know, that, I don't really care about that, you're still not right with God. You need to get right with God today because that is like the greatest news ever, ever. So maybe you're thinking right now, okay, so Paul, or maybe Pastor Steve, why have you been telling us this whole thing? I mean, what, what is this whole lesson about the resurrection supposed to teach us? Why is Paul telling us all this stuff about the resurrection? Well, that's why he ends off in verse 58. This is the reason why he spent all this time talking about the resurrection. He says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Once again, guys, this is the reason why Paul spends so much time talking about the resurrection. This is what you need to learn from it. He's saying, in light of everything I talked about the resurrection, it should cause you to be excited. It should cause you to stand firm in your faith. It should cause you to continue doing the work of evangelism. That's why he's telling this about the resurrection. Because if we have no hope of the resurrection, then we're all just going to lose faith. So he says, it's okay if you lose things in this life, if you lose your friends, if you lose opportunities. I mean, even if you lose a limb because somebody hated the gospel and they decided to attack you, it's okay because there's a resurrection that's coming in the future. So no matter how bad life gets, remember the resurrection gives us hope for living. Because like I said, the rapture is going to happen and that's when our resurrected bodies will come. So I want you guys to be ready to live holy, to evangelize, to serve cheerfully where we are at. So you know these three things that I talked about, the analogy, the order, and the process of the resurrection. Paul tells us all these things in order to tell us the resurrection is true and we must believe it for salvation. So I close by asking you this. Because maybe some of you guys, I don't know what your life is like right now, but I'm pretty sure eventually down the line, you're going to have a lot of difficulties in life. If it's not now, eventually it will happen in your life. Now, I don't want you to think that this life is the only thing that's left. Because Paul here is telling us that something greater is about to happen in the future. We have a new body to look forward to. So that is why if you still have not gone right with the Lord and made your peace, I want you to confess your sin before God and say, Lord God, I don't want to hold on to anything of this world. Whatever sins I'm in right now, I want to turn from it. And I want to follow my Lord God. Because you know what? If you do that, I'm telling you, your life is going to change. Whatever happens to you in this life, it's okay. It's only temporary. Because you know what? A new body is coming for you in the future. So that is why I want to plead with you guys. Continue to have faith. Continue to live holy. Continue to do the work of evangelism because Jesus says it's all worth it because one day, one day it's coming. A resurrected body is coming. So that is the thing you should be living for right now. Heavenly Father, we pray to thank you for this reminder that shows us what we have to look forward to. Because sometimes we can stress out in this life about our current bodies. We see it as something that we need to improve at all costs. We see this as the only life to live. 
but you tell us that a new body is coming in the future. But that new body can only be given to those who have their sins taken away. For that body is the consummation of salvation. Because once you remove sin from us, then the curse is lifted and we are restored, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that we will not get distracted or we won't get saddened by what happens to us in this life. But let us trust in the Lord God, knowing that you have something great for us in store, that you have a glorified body in store for us. So let that be the reason why, just as Paul said, we are steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And our work is not in vain. Even though sometimes we think it is, but in the end you remember it and you will reward us for that. So help us to keep strong in this faith and in this journey. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.